very nice that you're joining us. Uh, so we'll start in a few minutes. It's still not yet 11 o'clock, so we wait till more people are joining and then we will start at 11. In the meantime, I can start sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, morning or afternoon, uh, very much welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to, uh, to have this webinar and to see uh, you all attending. Uh, just for your information, your voice is deactivated, so you can't talk. But please, when you have any questions, do so in the chat. We will look at the chat and we will try to provide uh, the answer right away. And um, at the end, we will also show some email, email um, addresses of us. So if you still have some remaining questions, uh, we will reach out to you uh, and answer. So uh, I've shared my screen. Uh, so you see here, uh, welcome to today's webinar. And I'll present to you the uh, contribution of IHG Delft to capacity development of the humanitarian war sector. And my name is Tine Gormans. I'm associate professor at IHG Delft. And you also see a lot of logos from humanitarian and other organizations who were working together with us in this uh, capacity development initiative. So uh, what the content of this webinar will be is the following. I will first um, explain to you uh, the Graduate Professional Diploma Program on Humanitarian Watch and also introduce the key um, IHG staff involved. And then my colleague Shiris Singh, he will give a keynote lecture entitled Safety, Manage Sanitation in a Humanitarian Context. And it's a bit like a teaser of what you can expect when you follow the, uh, the educational program general professional diploma program and then we have a lot of time for questions and answers so the total duration of this webinar so first to give a bit of a background um, we started a couple of years ago with UNICEF uh, in a corporation framework and as you might know UNICEF is the lead of the global wash cluster and the Global Wash Cast Cluster developed a roadmap for 2020-2025 and they uh, expressed the need to strengthen the capacity of the humanitarian wash sector. And the aim was to consolidate a predictable pool of competent and skilled wash professionals that can be mobilized to respond in emergencies. So that led to the development of the Graduate Professional Diploma Program, and from now onwards, I just call it GPDP in humanitarian wash. So the process of the development was as follows. We first did a mapping of the offer, but also of the demand worldwide. And we identified the co-developers because uh, we are from an academic organization. We have some experience working in the humanitarian sector as well, but we needed really people from the humanitarian sector to be involved and work together with us on the content and the curriculum. So we developed the courses, we reviewed the courses and we launched an implementation, the first run in 2021. And we also did an evaluation to see in how far improvements were needed. So now what is this GPDP? It, is, it consists of four online courses. So we have the course on governance in humanitarian context, on public and environmental health in emergencies. 
on water and sanitation in urban humanitarian context and on building resilient systems in fragile context. And what you also see here <clears throat> behind in brackets are the starting dates of these different courses. I also put here the link, <clears throat> maybe you already found it. You can find there a lot of information on our website and also some testimonials Monios of some uh, students who took the first course and ended up in working in the humanitarian sector. Now, the targets, so for whom are those courses meant? So they are for WASH and or humanitarian professionals in their early or mid career who will take on a coordination or technical leadership role. So it's not a vocational training, it's a bit of a high level. So we're really aiming at people who take up leadership roles. So therefore you have to realize that um, the academic admission is all open to applicants who uh, have a bachelor degree. Um, so they have to demonstrate to have a, a university bachelor degree. Um, so the four online courses, when you complete them, you also get credits for them, for those courses that you can use maybe in, in other uh, courses that are, or programs that you will follow. Uh, it's an added value, but maybe it's not necessary for you, but there are 20 ECTS totally, and the courses comprise 560 study hours. So it's quite intense. Um, and what to explain a little bit about the courses, but the course coordinators are also with us so you can also ask them some questions afterwards we what we have done is to have one month between each of the module or course so a course and a module is, is uh, two words for the same um, so you need 20 months to complete the four courses because the idea is that the course when you follow a course it takes up about eight hours a week so you can do it parallel to your work and to your regular activities there is a lot of guidance between the topics and assignments so it's not like a MOOC it's really a facilitated course we have live ses sessions and also detailed communication on deadlines and follow-up on progress so you can opt for the GPDP, so the four courses in which uh, you do that sequentially, but you can also opt for one course as a standalone course if you're particularly interested in one topic only. So here you can see an overview of the courses, the coordinators and the humanitarian <clears throat> partners per course. So we have, for instance, the governance humanitarian context, we have Gabriella, and you see here the humanitarian partners for environmental and public health, we have Claire, for water and sanitation in urban uh, humanitarian context, we have Shiris, and Shiris also will give a presentation later. And we have for the building resilient systems, Akasua, and you see also here the for the other courses, the humanitarian partners. And beside those four courses, we also have like a course or a main page with cross cutting issues. Those cross cutting issues cover localization, inclusive response, accountability to affected population, gender and protection. And these are issues that are relevant to all areas of concern, meaning that these need to be kept at the forefront of how humanitarians think in the field. Now to put some faces with the, uh, the people involved. So here you can see the pictures of the staff involved who are the online course coordinators. So here we have Gabriella for humanitarian context. We have Claire, for uh, public and environmental health. We have Shiris for water and sanitation in urban context. And we have Akasua in building resilient systems in fragile context. So the coordinators are also with us, except Gabriela, who unfortunately is um, uh, working abroad now. Uh, but she will come back, but she's for a project abroad. We also have Corinne Danielle, and we're very happy to have Corinne also with us. She is an affiliate researcher of IHG, and she is the humanitarian wash specialist. And she was involved in the cross-cutting issues main page. We also have with us Tizia van der Zee, also very important because she's the fellowship and admission officer, and she can answer any questions with respect 
with respect to admission, application, deadlines, finance, etc. <clears throat> and I'm the uh, overall program coordinator of the GPDP. Now, just to give you an idea of how many students are present at, uh, at the GPDP uh, in, in the first run, uh, it were 28 students. We had four women only of those students. And here you can see a bit of the division, where they come from, uh, and also uh, so with respect to their work environment and also the origin. So as you can see, they come from different organizations, either humanitarian or university or private. And they also come from all over the world. Uh, yeah, so I, I can imagine that after this presentation, you might have a lot of questions on registration and deadlines and content and costs. So we're here to answer all of these questions, but not before we have the keynote presentation by Shiris Singh. So I would stop here and stop sharing my screen and I will give the floor to Shiris. Thank you, Tineke. Uh, let me just share my screen. I think I just need to change the display now. What is it? Now we can see your screen and see the slide, the first slide. Okay, so you see the full PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me just change the pointer. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this webinar and welcome. So as Tineke mentioned, I will uh, gi be giving a brief keynote on safely managed sanitation in humanitarian context. And I'll be referring to an example from Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. So my name is Siri Singh and I'm a senior lecturer at IHE Delft. So what I wanted to do is to maybe uh, start with uh, trying to see what is your understanding on safely managed sanitation. And what we wanted to do is to do a poll, but because of the limitation of the license with Zoom, we could not start the poll. But what you see here is there are three options for the definition of what is safely managed sanitation. So what I would request is now, having read these three options, it would be great if you can just type in your answer in the chat. So if you think uh, the safely managed sanitation is people using improved sanitation facilities that are not shared with other households, type in A in the chat. If you think safely managed sanitation is people using improved sanitation facilities that are not shared with other households and executa are disposed of in situ or in site, then type in uh, option B or just B in the chat. And if you think safely managed sanitation is people using improved sanitation facilities that are not shared and executa are safely disposed of in situ or removed and treated site. Please type C in the chat and then we will see how many of you have the right answer. So let's uh, give uh, around 30 seconds and then we will see. Uh, Shiris and Maria, I can't see the chat. Uh, I can see it. I just you need to click on the chat. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm getting a lot of responses on C, most of you. And that is the correct answer. So what is safely managed sanitation is people using improved sanitation facilities. Improved means that these are hygienically separate extra from the human contact that are not shared is a question mark. So if it is properly contained and there is no touching of human uh, excreta, it can be safe. And where the excreta are safely disposed, so safely means there is no contact of feces with human, which can be in situ or removed and treated offsite. So that is the definition of safely managed sanitation. And thank you, most of you have got the right answer. So let me move on. So before I move into the details of the safety managed sanitation in Cox's Bazaar, I just want to take you through this simple slide of the sanitation service chain 
or the value chain, which typically follows a straight line. You have a containment, which is emptied and transported and taken to a treatment plant where it's properly treated. And if there is a reused product, it's reused and safely disposed. And when we talk about sanitation value chain or the service chain, we talk of two systems. The first is the offsite systems, sewerage or wastewater, where you have a toilet, you flush your feces or excreta, which is conveyed to a treatment plant through a network of sewer pipes. And sometimes if the gravity is not enough, then you might have some pumping stations to pump the sewer. Um, and then uh, in the treatment plant, it is properly treated and it is either reused or disposed safely. The second is the on-site systems. Uh, sometimes we also call it fecal sludge management, where you have a toilet that goes to a containment and in most cases is either a pit or a septic tank, which needs to be emptied at regular intervals. So the emptying can be done either by primary emptying and transferred, or you can also use vacuum trucks to empty the fecal sludge. Ideally, it goes to a treatment plant where it is properly treated and the reused products is reused and safely disposed. And sometimes you can also have safe burial. That is, for example, if you have a pit and you bury it safely, and then you dig on the next pit and use the next pit for the toilets, it can also be considered as safely managed sanitation. And now what I also want to talk is to separate the period of MDG, that's the Million Development Goals, and the SDG, that's the Sustainable Development Goals. And we all know that in the MDG period, a lot of focus was on access to sanitation. Whereas when we moved to the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, we started talking about safely managed sanitation. And to, in order to know the situation of sanitation in a city or in a defined area, what we use is, is called a sit flow diagram. And what you see in the diagram is the uh, sanitation situation in context of the containment, emptying, transport, and treatment. And you will also see the different type of sanitation facilities that are used in the city or the area. So here you see is on-site and it's off-site. And the green arrows and the blocks shows you how much it is safely managed. And here what you see is the sheet floor diagram from the development side for a Cox's Bazaar municipality. And what you see here in the municipality is most of the people are solved with on-site systems, around 95 and 5% are solved with off-site systems and so wastewater and sewer networks. And you see there is no open defecation. That's why you have a star here. But if you look at it, then uh, you have uh, almost 100% access to sanitation, out of which only a certain percentage is emptied and transported. And then further, a certain percentage is uh, treated. So if you look at it, only 20% of the fecal sludge is safely treated or safely managed. And if you look at that in more in details, it's only those which are contained and not emptied. So that means after some period of time, it might need emptying. But since there is no treatment planned in this municipality, it will end up in unsafely managed sanitation. So now let's take a look at an example from the humanitarian response. And this is from uh, the Cox's Bazaar, Hakimpara, site, which is the camp 14 of Cox's Bazaar. And if you see here, here, most of it again is served with on-site systems. And if you see here, about 65% of the sanitation is safely managed. It's because there is a emptying and transport services as well as treatment plant in the Cox's Bazaar camp number 14. And now when you compare this with the development sector, it seems that we are doing good in the humanitarian side. And the primary reason for that is because you have a lot of resources, both financial and human in emergency response. And in contrast with what we saw in the development side is the municipality has limited resources to provide safely managed services. And this is just to, uh, to give you an overview of the different components of the sanitation value chain in Cox's Bazaar. And as I said, we follow this uh, chain of containment, emptying transport, treatment, and reuse disposal. And if you look at the containment, these are the main three types of containment that are implemented in Cox's Bazaar. That's a single pit latrine, twin pit latrine, 
and septic tank. And here you see some of the numbers as around 49,500 latrines in the camps, and it is serving around 21 persons per toilet. And as per the sphere standards, it's 20, slightly more than that, but it's okay. But 99% are reporting using the toilets. And then it is serving, look at the population, around 900,000 people. So it's like a small city in itself. And then when you see into the emptying and transport, here they have like three systems for desludging. The first one is desludging through pumps. Second is desludging through vacuum tugs. And third is manual. I will go into a bit of details in the coming slides. And for the transportation, they have like four types of transportation. So for this FSTN, I will have another slide to explain a bit more on that. It's an innovative thing that has been done in Cox's Bazaar. There's a pit-to-pit -pit transfer, vacuum trucks, and sometimes it's also carried in drums and tricycles. So let's not go into the details of the numbers for the emptying and transport. And similarly, for the treatment, there are many treatment plants that have been tested and used in Cox's Bazaar. And some of the technology that are, have been used are seen here. So they have, some have anaerobic baffle reactors, some have DWATs, lagoons, drying beds, and so on. And when it comes to the reuse and disposal, these are the main uh, products that can come out from the fecal cell treatment plant. For example, uh, the treated liquid can be used in agriculture or disposed in surface drains, can be infiltrated into the ground. If you have incineration, you can use the byproducts, can have deep burial, and there's also one a pilot uh, omni processor installed in Cox's Bazaar. And now let me go into a bit of details from each of the component. So let me start with the containment. So as I described earlier, uh, the, the, there are three main types of containment that has been uh, promoted in Cox's Bazaar and that has been categorized as per the types. For example, for the type of the substructure, it has three single twin pit and septic tanks. And based on the latrine, it can have a superstructure with concrete post and wooden frames or steel frame. And based on the cubicles that are there in the, in the toilet, it can be single, double, or four. And what we have seen is uh, it is very well coordinated in the case of Cox's Bazaar and the local government uh, in, in, in the form of Office of the Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner they have come up with 16 standard designs for the uh, latrines or toilets. So what usually happens is in case of emergency, a lot of stakeholders just jump in to provide help and support to the community, and they will start promoting toilets as per their own standards, which may not be the standards required for that country. And the good thing about the Cox's Bazaar is now they have these standards and all the toilets that are being promoted are standard toilets. And here you see some of the figures of a single cubicle uh, latrine here. Here you have like a four cubicle latrine. Uh, the concrete rings that are used for pit latrines. And there's a couple of things that you need to consider while you are promoting sanitation facilities is whether the toilets are properly used or not. So if somebody is throwing solid waste in that uh, pit latrines, then it might create uh, problems at the later stage of the sanitation value chain. We have to see whether it is properly maintained or not, especially if you are talking about uh, community or shared latrines. And if it's not well maintained, the people might not be willing to use the toilets and they might go back to open defecation, which you don't want. And also what we need to emphasize is if the containments are properly sealed or not. If not, it might be creating environmental pollution by leaking the contaminants into the groundwater. And let's move on to the emptying and transport. As I also described earlier, there are several uh, emptying and transport systems uh, tried out and used in Cox's Bazaar. The first one I say is a semi-mechanized one. So here what you see is a group of sanitation workers. And they are emptying the pit or the tank with the help of a pump. And then this uh, fecal sludge is then pumped into, for example, here you see uh, plastic tanks, which is loaded into a pickup and then transported to a treatment plant. And what I also want to show here is in the top picture you see here, uh, people are using some sort of safety equipment. We call it PPE, personal protective equipment. But here you see some of them are using helmets, but not proper use of 
personal protective equipment. So that means these workers are exposed to high occupational safety and health risk. And now if you move to the completely uh, or fully mechanized systems, you have like vacuum trucks here that has a pump attached with the truck and that goes out and then uh, empties the fecal sludge and transfers to the treatment plant. And the other one, what is also seen in practice in Cox's Bazaar is a manual emptying and transport, although that is discouraged, but sometimes you cannot avoid that. So for example, here you see there are two people, they are handling the uh, or emptying the fecal cells from a pit latrine uh, with some uh, buckets, which is transported or stored in this small uh, plastic, blue plastic containers, and then either carried by the workers towards the treatment plant, or with the use of, let's say, a tricycle that can be transported to the treatment plant. And here, what I wanted to show here is sometimes because of the gradient of the uh, area, and since you see there are no roads available, maybe for some period of time, only manual emptying is possible. But wherever the situation is, it is recommended that people who are involved in sanitation systems, they use some sort of personal protective equipment as you see in the picture uh, in this one. And this one is the Intermediate Fecal Sludge Transfer Network, which is an innovative, let's say, methodology that is used to transport fecal sludge. And this diagram shows you the process, how it is done. So in the first picture you see is uh, they are trying to empty this uh, septic tank. So first they uh, manually stir the septic tank contents because the thicker sludge is settled at the bottom and you have liquid at the top. So you completely mix the tank so that the pump can empty the entire uh, tank in one go. Then uh, through the pipes and pumps, it is either uh, transferred to a pit or a box, or it is directly transferred to a transfer station. Here you see a plastic tank. Then from this one, it is further pumped to the next transfer station and finally to the treatment plant. So this is the recommended, uh, let's say, transportation of uh, fecal sludge in, in Cox's Bazaar. And some of the key things that we need to take into account or understand about the accessibility of the pits or tanks. So sometimes because of the narrow road width or the gradient, trucks may not be able to access the pits or the tanks. So in that case, either you have to go for semi-mechanized emptying or you sometimes you also need to go for manual emptying. Another thing what you also need to take, take into account is the spillage. So what we have also seen in, in many emptying and transport is that there's a lot of spillage of fecal sludge while they are emptying it. And that means if there is a higher spillage, it is leading to environmental contamination as well as higher risk occupational and safety health uh, risk to the workers. And related with that is also the safety of workers. As I also discussed earlier, it is recommended that the sanitation workers use uh, personal protective equipment when they are handling fecal sludge. And the other point, what I also want to emphasize is what happens with the collected fecal sludge. So in this case, for the IFSTN, it is more or less uh, assured that all the fecal sludge that is emptied are transported or pumped to the treatment plant. But sometimes when you are using trucks or manual emptying, the guarantee, it should be guaranteed that the collected fecal sludge is transported to the treatment plant. Otherwise the system will not work. And now what I wanted to show you is just to take you through the journey of sanitation in Kongsis Bazaar. And we'll try to highlight the need of different components of sanitation value chain that needs to be addressed with the passage of time. So what you see here in this uh, graph or diagram is the sanitation situation in 2017, which is just the start of the response in Cox's Bazaar. And what you see is there are, are a lot of toilet constructions in the beginning. So around 10,000 toilets were constructed and only a small portion of the toilets were um, discharged or emptied. I will not discuss more about this uh, decommissioning and operational maintenance, but I'll come back to it a bit later. So in the next year, still there is a lot of construction going on, 
of the toilets because you have a lot of influx of uh, refugees coming into the Cox's Bazaar. But at the same time, you see the latrines that are dishless, the numbers are getting higher. And if, if you further move to the next year, and you see the number of toilets that is constructed is very low. So that means you have almost reached the highest uh, amount of toilets that needs to be constructed. But if you look at the dislodging, it is getting higher and higher. So that means once you have provided sanitation facilities, you need to empty it regularly so that you can provide safely managed sanitation services. And then if you now look at the overall picture from 2017 until 2023, you see the number of latrines construction is very small compared with the emptying and transport. So what you need to understand is in the beginning of the phase, the main focus will be on the construction of toilets that is providing access to sanitation. But as the time passes, more focus will shift to the following components of the sanitation value chain. So now let me go to the treatment. Uh, before I go into the treatment in Cox's Bazaar, I just wanted you to explain a little bit about the theory of a fecal surge treatment and the different treatment stages that you can have in a fecal surge treatment plan. So once you have the raw fecal surge that is coming to your treatment plan, so you can have a sort of receiving chamber or receiving stations, then you might have a, a, a core screening. Sometimes we also call it a preliminary treatment where you try to separate the coarse particles from the fecal sludge. And depending on the quality of the fecal sludge, you might also have further primary treatment, especially if you want to remove grits and fats, oil, and grease. Then you move to the next stage, that's basically the solid liquid separation. And you can have a different treatment technologies for solid liquid separation. Here you can uh, see two main uh, processes. One is the sedimentation, and then you can use either a gravity thickener or settling thickening tanks. You can also use mechanical press, for example, screw press or belt filter press to separate the solid and the liquid. And once you have separated the solid and the liquid, you treat them in separate streams. And that, that makes treatment much easier than treating the combined liquid and the solid fraction of uh, fecal sludge. Uh, in the liquid uh, uh, portion, you can use any wastewater treatment technologies that uh, can be used for treating the fecal sludge liquid uh, portion. Uh, if you are going for anaerobic treatment systems, it can be anaerobic ponds, uh, baffled reactors, or UASB. And if you go for aerobic systems, it can be facultative ponds, aerated ponds, trickling filters, and so on. For the solids, uh, you try to first dewater the solids so you can handle the solids in a better or easier way. And then you can have unplanted drying beds or planted drying beds. And sometimes you can also have presses to uh, dewater the solids. So these uh, drying beds can uh, serve two purposes. One is the solid liquid separation as well as solids dewatering. And after that dewatering, you can have further solids treatment in terms of uh, drying and pathogen reduction. And these are the, some of the technologies that you can use. And then further, you can use it as conditioner or fuel. And for the liquid part, once you have done the major treatment, you might need some further treatment, especially for pathogen removal. And you can use maturation ponds or constructed wetlands. And then the treated liquid can be used for uh, irrigation or can be discharged in the water course. And wetlands, as I said, can also be uh, done in two uh, stages, also for the main treatment, as well as for pathogen removal. And this diagram, what I'm showing is the number of fecal cell treatment plants that are constructed or used in Cox's Bazaar. So in total, there are more than 180 treatment plants. And if you see these uh, dots, uh, squares in different colors, these are the location of different treatment plants in the Cox's Bazaar camps. And here you see the list of different treatment technologies that are used in Cox's Bazaar. For example, ABR, is used in 45 uh, treatment plants and let's say uh, waste stabilization ponds in 13 treatment plants. And there are also two big mega FSTPs and I will talk a bit more in details about this FSTP uh, because I was also involved in the design of one of the mega FSTPs. So for the design of a, a mega FSTP in Cox's Bazaar, first thing what we did is to establish the design criteria. 
And one of the factors that is very crucial in the design of FSTP is the quantity and quality of fecal studs, or in short, Q and Q. So quantity is a bit easier to establish because you can do it uh, by the tank volume, the number of tanks that are emptied, and the so on. But when it comes to quality of fecal studs, it's very different. And I'm just showing an example. What you see on the right is the variation of the carbon in fecal starch. And in, in carbon, I'm talking about the COD or the chemical oxygen demand. And if you see the variations, uh, in some fecal starch, the COD was as high as around 40,000 milligram per liter. And in some cases, it was as low as a few hundred milligrams per liter. So what shall we do and what shall the value that we take for the design? If you design with this low COD value, you are undersizing your uh, treatment plan. And if you are using high COD value, you might be uh, over designing your treatment plan. So what we did is we said, okay, let's take a 75 percentile value and design the treatment plan. So we took a value of around uh, 14,500 milligram per liter for the COD values. And similarly, we did it for the other nitrogen and phosphorus. The other thing what we also took into consideration is the cost. So in emergency, what happens is like you need quick treatment. So you opt for chemical treatment, for example, uh, lime treatment, but it is quite uh, cost intensive. And in the long run, especially if you move from the acute response phase to the stabilization or the recovery phase, you try to find uh, more economical options. And their uh, biological treatment uh, systems are much more economical than the chemical systems. So one of the criteria that we also took into account when we're designing the mega FSTP is it should be a biological process. And then uh, depending on the technology that you choose, you require a certain area of land. So the mechanical treatment systems are uh, land intensive. No, it requires less than, but uh, natural treatment systems requires more land. But when it comes to economics or cost, uh, uh, conventional systems and aerated systems are more costly compared with uh, aerobic and natural systems. And the other two criteria that also we talk, took into account is the availability of the skill manpower to operate the systems and availability of the energy to run the systems. So based on these criteria, what we came up with the design is that I'm going to show in the next slide is this one. So what we have is the raw fecal starch coming in uh, from the pumps. It can be from the IFSTN that we discussed earlier. Then it's first pumped through a core screen through the planted drying beds. There are five planted drying beds to be operated in rotation. Then the solids part will remain in the planted drying bed for three years, and then it will be removed after stabilization. The liquid part or the percolate will first pass through these anaerobic filters, which further goes into a vertical flow constructed wetland, followed by a horizontal flow constructed wetland, and finally to the maturation pond for uh, more pathogen removal. And now what I will do is I will show you some of the photos of these units. The first one is the planted drying beds where you see uh, two different planted drying beds uh, that were implemented. And what you see is these pipes, these are bringing in the fecal starch to the planted drying beds, which will remain there for uh, three or four years. And the liquid will percolate through the layer of sand and further goes to the anaerobic filters. Uh, this is the diagram showing the anaerobic filter where you have uh, a lot of chambers first going through. Uh, in the anaerobic uh, filters, what you try to do is you force the liquid to come into contact with the sludge. So that means bacteria. So you have a uh, better removal than a septic tank. And, and, and at the last chamber, you have a, a filter media. And what we use is coconut husk in the Cox's Bazaar that will further uh, treat or remove the contaminants from the liquid portion of the fecal sludge. And this is how you see from the top. Then it goes into first a vertical flow constructed wetland, which you see in this picture. 
So you see a network of pipes that is feeding in the uh, liquid and it percolates from the main filter media, which is sand in case of particle flow constructor wetland. And the treated effluent is collected by your network of uh, perforated pipes at the bottom. And then it further leads to a horizontal flow constructor wetland where the uh, liquid passes from one end of the horizontal flow wetlands to the other end through a filter media of coarse gravel. And here you see the inlet of the horizontal flow wetland where the liquid passes from this and flow horizontally towards the right, which it is collected by uh, this uh, outlet channel. And now what I wanted to show here is the status of fecal surge treatment in Cox's Bazaar. And the good thing about the Cox's Bazaar is there is a lot of uh, data and that has been, oh, that is public uh, and we can always see the quality of fecal surge treated in Cox's Bazaar. So what you see here is the uh, sampling parameters, for example, pH, BOD, COD, and so on. And you also see the effluent standards that is required to be met by the treatment plants. For example, for COD, the effluent should be uh, not more than uh, 125 milligram per liter. And here you see the top row is the inlet values and the middle row is the outlet values. So if you see here, uh, this inlet value of COD is around 14,000 something, which is more similar to what I also mentioned about the mega FSTP, COD um, finding. And then if you look at this diagram, what it shows is only 10% of the samples were meeting the standards of 125 milligram per liter. And the rest, these are above the uh, required standards. So what it means, like even if there are many treatment plants in Cox's Bazaar, in many cases, it is not meeting the required effluent standards. And what could be the reasons for that is the quality of the treatment, depending on the treatment technology that is selected uh, for the treatment, or it can also be with regards to the quantity and quality of the fecal sludge. And secondly, the most important factor is the operation and maintenance of the fecal sludge treatment plan. If it is properly operated and maintained, it should uh, be able to achieve the required standards. And now, uh, after this, what I wanted to quickly go through is, is a bit of, of differences of working in the human and response in the urban settings compared with rural or camp settings. And this is also one of the focus of our GPDP, where we focus a lot on urban human crisis. So, for example, you can take about the crisis in, in Ukraine or in Palestine or Syria or the earthquake in, in, in Turkey. So when you are working in urban context, you basically uh, uh, encounter four specific uh, complexities and challenges. The first is you are working with a complex and diverse communities. So it can be in terms of ethnicity, religion, nationality, if there's a disaster happening in one country and there's an influx of, of the people to other country, for example, in the uh, case of uh, Rohingya camps in Cox's Bazaar. And in urban context, uh, you have two different strata of people living in, in the urban context, one with high uh, income people and the other with low income people. And there be, uh, can be a tussle of power relationship and also access to services. So if, if you see in the urban context, uh, people living in high income areas will have uh, better access to services compared with the people living in low income area or slum and squatter settlements. And what we also see in the urban context is there's a high mobility of migration. For example, people coming into urban centers in search of jobs or people going out of, of, of the town to look for a job other, other, uh, elsewhere. And also uh, we, what we have seen is in many cases, uh, people are living in rented places. So that means they are not the owners of, of uh, the house and they are, might be reluctant to provide or invest in providing sanitation services. The second complexity, what you can also encounter in urban context is the infrastructure systems. Generally, they are fragmented. And as I mentioned earlier, they have varying level of services depending on the area and also in the income of the people. And what we have also seen is there are several actors uh, taking a role in different components of the sanitation service chain. 
For example, in case of emptying and transport, you might have uh, private entrepreneurs or informal workers providing the services, whereas it, when it comes to the treatment, maybe it, it can be a public sector. And as I also mentioned earlier, urban poor, they have very poor access to water and sanitation services. And uh, I'm checking about the specific example of this internally displaced peoples or people coming from a foreign country that creates an increased demand of the services in a particular town or a city. And that might be outside the scope and capacity of the local authorities. So that is a, a challenge that uh, the local uh, service providers or the municipality face when there is a disaster. And what we also see is uh, uh, sometimes water and sanitary services is linked with other services, for example, electricity. So if you ha have a system that has pumps, you can operate the pump without electricity. So that means there's a clear linkages with the electricity in that particular town or the city. And similarly with the transport, for example, if you have roads that are damaged, you might not be able to transport the vehicles with trucks. Moving on, uh, the third complexity that you can face in urban context is, is markets. In, in um, urban context, everything is commercialized. And you will find a lot of actors involved in the sanitation service provision for in the case of public and private sectors. And all of them have their own uh, vested interest in providing the services. And then when you are responding to a crisis, you also impact on the revenue collection especially because when it comes to the emergency phase of the humanitarian response, most of the goods and services are provided free of charge. And that means those who are making a living from that service is denied of their livelihood. And that will destroy the urban-based markets and can also threaten the livelihoods of the people, those who are involved in the service provision. And finally, on, on the local governance and the structures, what I wanted, wanted to mention here is there is a limited or lack of capacity of local government, especially in the low and middle income countries. And they might not have the capacity in terms of human and financial resources to respond to the crisis. And as I said, it adds value. It adds more pressure on the local government because most of the, uh, of the documents can be damaged. And without that, it's not possible uh, to plan a good humanitarian response, which adds burden on the local authorities to uh, provide the information for proper planning. And with that, I think I will stop here. No, uh, let me just, uh, just summarize the key takeaways uh, from what I have just uh, explained, is that the first thing is, you need to intervene in the all components of the sanitation value chain. So as I said, so in the beginning, it might be that your focus is more on the access to sanitation or the containment. Then slowly you should move towards the emptying and transport and treatment to provide safely managed sanitation services. Otherwise, it will not be possible. The second point, uh, the key takeaway is the proper operational maintenance. Without that, uh, the services that you are going to provide will not be or may not be sustainable. And when we talk about sustainable, in the wash sector, in especially in Netherlands, we take into account these five different aspects that are the financial, institutional, environmental, and social aspects. So you need to consider all these aspects in order to provide sustainable sanitation solutions. And fourthly, the key takeaway is on the safety. So you need to... Uh, provide importance, especially to sanitation workers, that they minimize the occupational safety and health risk when they are handling a fecal sludge or excreta. The fifth one is now you need to think of a, a long-term plan whenever you start uh, providing humanitarian response. Because without that, what happens is like the intervention that you have provided in the beginning may not be uh, sustainable in the long run. And that will also help you to find proper solutions from the very beginning if you have a clear vision of how you want to do it in the long-term uh, response. And finally, uh, coordination and collaboration is very important. Without that, uh, you will not be able to provide sustainable sanitation service provision. And here, what you see, the two pictures here, in contrast, the first one is the first 
just uh, the establishment of the fecal cell treatment plan. And after some time, it is not working properly, maybe uh, because of several reasons. And that what we don't want in the uh, in the sentence in the sustainable sentence service provision. And with that, I think I will stop here, and then I think we are open to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Over to you, Tineke. Okay, Sirius, thank you very much for sharing your experiences in Cox Bazaar and the different uh, sanitation systems from containment to treatment in the end. So I think that was very insightful and we have uh, some questions also content on the content that you presented. So maybe you can have a look now uh, at the chat. So some people are asking in how far this is representative for other humanitarian um, uh, uh, systems. So, for instance, in Africa, what you explained about the empty and the transport, maybe you can quickly comment on that. I'm just trying to find the chat. Okay, yeah. Okay, maybe you can do it in the chat indeed. So just have a look. Uh, what we yeah. also can do is is to, to let you know that we will share the recordings. We will share the PowerPoint presentations for all uh, people who are with us now and registered. Um, and we also will look at the questions in the chat and we will type like a summary uh, uh, related to the questions that you have. Uh, what we can maybe do now is focus on some questions that you might have in relation to the GPDP, because I also saw a lot of questions coming by there. We have also with us some of the module coordinators. Maybe they can share their camera that we can see them. And we also have Tizia with us, who knows all about appli the application process. So, um, Maria, I don't know if people can now unmute themselves, ask a question. Can you can uh, no, no, I mean, I mean we, we can. We have raised them chat, 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 well, uh, uh, chat, chat with us. Not, not, okay, uh, so. Yeah, yeah. We have to look at the chat box for questions like that. Titia, maybe you have seen some of the questions passing by on registration. Maybe you can summarize a bit of those questions. Um, yes, most questions were about how to apply. Um, uh, maybe it's good to know there are two websites. There's the website, the common web website of IG Delft, where you can find the program. I, can, I will type the uh the link in the chat uh here you can find uh a general information about the program you can also uh um uh link to the apply website but we have an apply website where you can apply directly so then you can choose can choose which uh, program you want to apply for, and that's more di direct. But if you want some background information, you should go to the uh, IHE website. Um, yeah. <laughs> and for some questions on costs. Right. Yes, the costs. Um, well, it consists of four courses. Each course uh, is 1,065 euros. If you choose to uh, participate in a whole program, uh, you have to pay this tuition fee four times. But if you uh, can afford to uh, pay for the whole program upfront, you will receive a discount of 10%. So for four courses, if you pay the full prices of the courses, it will be 4,260 euro. And if you pay upfront for the whole program, it will be 3,834 euros. I think Tineke uh, also sent this information in the chat. Um, but if you have any questions about this, you can al always uh, write an email to me and I will respond. So maybe some things are not clear now, but we can discuss this later. No problem. Yeah, exactly. So now you know the, the email is online course registration, I think. Yeah, uh, TCS. yeah, so yeah. You know yeah, the yeah. person behind this email address, so she, she can help you with any questions yeah. that you have. 
Uh, there are also questions on fellowships. Uh, we don't have fellowships for the um, online courses and online education, but what happened previously was also that um, humanitarian organizations have or might have for their staff, for their own staff, fellowships for training. So uh, several students that participated before received a fellowship or like a, a contribution from their organization to participate in, in these kind of courses. Uh, but really realize when you don't have that, it's very expensive uh, still. It, it is not more expensive than when you look at other organizations or university, but still it, it's a lot of money. But you could also opt for instance of doing one course and then see if you would like to continue uh, later on. Um, let me see. Tineke, shall yes. I take some questions? Yes, sure. Yes, I'm following the chat. And now uh, one, one interesting question that we have from is Anthony. Uh, he talks about this uh, online pit latrines in Uganda and uh, solid waste is, is a challenge there, uh, right? I mean, I said, and it's also not uh, safely uh, contained. And the question is, what is the best way to manage the solid waste in the fecal church? And I think uh, one of the best way to manage church is to aware the people about the challenges that can um, pose uh, for the sanitation, which uh, I think is uh, the awareness uh, raging and behavioral change uh, and to educate the people. So let me go to the other one. Uh, what I see here is uh, on drying beds. Uh, the question is whether it's roofed or not. So in case of uh, Cox's Bazaar, there are some drying beds which are roofed and some which are not roofed so it really depends on the let's say rainfall pattern in that particular area so if you are expecting quite a huge rainfall it is recommended to provide a roof otherwise it may not be that necessary and also there's a question about the fstps and to design hazards like flooding events yes in most cases they are built above the high flood water levels. And this is also one of the criteria what you need to uh, take into account when you are selecting uh, the site for the fecal cell treatment plant. Okay, and I think this is more about the GPDP. I think that's all I can deal at it at this moment. Over to you, okay. Tineke. Okay, thank you very yeah. much, uh, Shiris. We are running a bit towards the end of this uh, webinar. Um, so I would also like to give the floor uh, to Maria. Um, there is a hand raised now that this. Uh, okay, maybe you the, the people. There's a hand up. To, yeah, people are asked to uh, type in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, so everybody is muted. So that's the organizer, uh, Maria. She decided to so. Maria, um... if there is a question that uh, was not answered so far, please uh, write it again so that uh, we can still uh, have time to get back to you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will uh, follow uh, to all of you with these presentations and also with a video of this webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you get in touch to us about this. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for all for coming. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. Yes. Mm, yes. Oh, discounts and scholarships. Yeah. Tinka, I yeah, think you already answered yeah, that. Uh, yeah, we actually yeah. we mentioned the, on the uh, scholarships. There are no scholarships and there is no discount. Only I think if you have done already something at IHC, like a master program, mm -hmm. uh, you can get a discount. Uh, yeah. New and there's a question on the medium of um uh, on English proficiency. Uh, so as an English language, it doesn't apply with medium of instruction as an English language proficiency. I don't exactly understand what it meant. It might be in uh, which kind of uh, English proficiency do they need to have to to join our course? Okay, Titia. Uh, we don't require an English test for uh, for this program. So we only ask that you uh, state that your level of English is sufficient. 
but uh, there are no tests required. So this, the university statement is sufficient. Yeah. And this question keeps coming up. I think the number of students enrolled, do we have a limit for the students that can be enrolled? No. In, in the course, you mean? Yeah, no, so in the far, course. Yeah, so far, I think uh, there is like a limit maybe of like 30, 40 people, uh, but we never reached that uh, number. So I don't think people have to be scared about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and if that's that's the case, then indeed people would have to wait one year because we are um, running the, the GPDP each and every year we start again, uh, provided that we have sufficient uh, people uh, applied and, and paying for the courses. Uh, okay, we, we are uh, almost one minute. So we have here also Sina Kosua as one of the, uh, the course leaders. I think we also have with us Karine, Karine and, and Claire, maybe you can also show your video. Um, then we can see you. Yeah, can you see? Oh, yeah, yeah Karin. Hi. <laughs> it's difficult to see. Hi. <laughs> so there's Karin, uh, our affiliate uh, staff member to IIT Delft, who, um, yeah, who helped us also with developing of the program and gave a lot of presentations. Um, and do we also have Claire? Claire is, Claire is not, not here. here. Claire is not here. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so that was all. I, I hope you enjoyed it and, and got some idea. And um, well, for more questions, you can always reach out to us. Uh, yeah, and it was great to see this uh, large number of, uh, of attendances. So have a nice day and uh, see you hopefully at some time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, nice Thank you. Bye. Thank you.